the Moral and Kashmir Stag. The Caspian deer, or Moral, is a magnificent subspecies, incomparably the finest representative of the red deer species. Standing about 4 feet 6 inches at the shoulder, a good stag will weigh as much as 40 stone clean, and exceptional specimens probably a good deal more. The range of this noble beast includes the Caspian provinces of North Persia, Transcaucasia, the Caucasus, and the Crimea. There can be little doubt that the great stags shot in the Galatian Carpathians are Caspian red deer, and not the ordinary red deer of Western Europe. The red deer of Turkey is, too, no doubt referable to this subspecies. Continuing our survey of typical deer, we come to the Kashmir stag, which is a magnificent beast, standing as much as 4 feet 4 inches at the shoulder, and carrying antlers approaching the red deer type, which measure in fine specimens from 45 to 48 inches. The Kashmir stag, often miscalled Barsing by Indian sportsmen, makes its home in the forest regions of the north side of the Kashmir Valley, ranging chiefly on altitudes of from 5,000 to 12,000 feet. The summer coat is rufous, in winter the pelage is of a darkish brown. The Yarkin stag is an apparently allied species, found in the forests bordering on the Yarkand or Taran River. Two more stags close the list of those Asiatic deer which approximate more or less closely to the red deer type. These are the Shu or Sikkim stag, and Thorold's deer, concerning neither of which animals is much known at present. The shoe, of which only the head has yet been brought to England, appears to be a very large stag, in size approximating to the gigantic wapiti. The antlers are very large, extending to as much as 55 inches over the outer curve. So far as is at present known, this great deer is found in the country north of Bhutan and the valley eastward of Chumbi, which drains northward into the Sangpo. No European hunter, it is believed, has ever yet leveled a rifle or even set eyes on this noble deer. In England, Thorold's deer is known from two specimens shot by Dr. W. G. Thorold during a journey across Tibet at an elevation of about 13,500 feet. The high Tibetan plateau and other adjacent parts of Central Asia form the habitat of this species. In size, Thorold's deer is about on a level with the Kashmir stag. The coat is dark brown, the antlers are distinctive in their backward curve, in the lack of the bez tine, and their flattened appearance. The muzzle and chin are pure white, as is the inner surface of the ears. Wapiti Wapiti are the giants of the red deer group, carrying enormous antlers and attaining as much as 1,000 pounds in weight. The true wapiti of North America, known in that country chiefly by the local name of elk, carry by far the finest and the heaviest heads of any of the typical deer kind. Mr. Roland Ward, in his book Records of Big Game, gives the length of antlers of a 12-pointer shot in the Olympic Mountains, Washington State, as 70 inches over the outer curve, while another specimen, also a 12-pointer, taken from a wapiti shot in Wyoming, measures 66 inches. Occasional heads bear as many as 17, 19, and even 20 times of points, but from 12 to 14 points are more usual in fine average heads. A good stag will stand from 5 feet 4 inches to 5 feet 8 inches at the shoulder. Magnificently shaped, splendid in form and bearing, as in the size of its antlers, a more lordly creature than the stag wapiti does not pace the earth. The wapiti, says Colonel Theodore Roosevelt in the Encyclopedia of Sport, is highly polygamous, and during the rut the master bulls gather great harems about them and do fierce battle with one another, while the weaker bulls are driven off by themselves. At this time, the bulls are comparatively easy to approach, because they are very noisy, incessantly challenging one another by night and day. Settlers and hunters usually speak of their challenge as whistling, but this is a very inadequate description. The challenge consists of several notes, first rising and then falling. Heard nearby, especially among unattractive surroundings, it is not particularly impressive, varying in tone from a squeal to a roar, and ending with grunts, 
but at a little distance, it is one of the most musical sounds in nature, sounding like some beautiful wind instrument. Nothing makes the heart of a hunter leap and thrill like the challenge of a wapiti bull, as it comes peeling down under the great archways of the mountain pines, through the still, frosty fall weather, all the more if it be at night, under the full moon, and if there is a light snow on the ground. Wapiti in North America have suffered much from persecution, and it is now difficult, indeed, to secure fine heads like those that fell to hunters twenty or thirty years since. Twelve or fifteen years ago, during winter time, bands of Wapiti in Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana were to be seen gathered together to the number of thousands. Now, a score or two is the rule, where these animals are to be found at all. However, by those who know where to go for their game, and can hold a rifle straight, wapiti are still to be obtained. Mr. Sullis, in his Sport and Travel East and West, thus describes a recent experience. After a few seconds of agonizing suspense, a noble-looking monarch of the mountains walked slowly from the shelter of the pine trees and followed the ladies of his household, who had now halted about fifty yards down the slope passing in quite open ground not more than sixty or seventy yards below me, and as the stag followed them, I waited until he came past, though he had been well within shot ever since he came out from among the trees. As he did not know where I was, and probably had not the least idea why the hinds had trotted off, he came along very leisurely, looking magnificent, for although his antlers were but moderate in size, there were no others of larger proportions near to dwarf them and even a very ordinary wapiti stag, seen at short range in its native wilds, is a glorious sight to look upon. I let him get a little past me, and then put one of Holland's peg bullets just behind his shoulder, low down. I saw by the convulsive rush forwards that he made that he was struck through the heart, but I did not expect so large an animal to collapse so quickly. He had not gone twenty paces after being hit, when he fell suddenly, right on to the prostrate stem of a large tree, which did not, however, stop him, as the impetus of his fall carried him over it, and he then went sliding at a terrific pace down the steep snow slope below, and disappeared from sight almost immediately. The dead wapiti was ultimately found five hundred feet below, with the antlers, strangely enough, scarcely injured, but the body in quarters much bruised by the fall. He was a very pretty fourteen-pointer of moderate size. A fight between two wapiti stags is a terrific encounter. With heads lowered between their forefeet, says Mr. Perry, the two adversaries walk around, waiting for an opening, and when one is thrown off his guard, the other makes a savage rush, but his opponent instantly recovers, counters the charge, and as they rush together, the antlers strike each other with such terrific force that the report can be heard for a long distance. Slowly retreating, bellowing, grumbling, and grinding their teeth in a paroxysm of rage, they again circle round. The challenging wapiti usually does most of the offensive fighting until he finds, if such be the case, that he is the weaker. Then he suddenly retires, bellowing as he goes. In the old days, the Indians of North America were in the habit of organizing great wapiti drives. Entire herds were surrounded by a ring of mounted men and forced over precipices. In recent years, it has been discovered that wapiti are also denizens of certain parts of Asia. At least two subspecies, the Altai wapiti and the Manchurian wapiti, have thus far been identified. The former, sometimes known as the Thian Shan stag, is found in the forests of the Altai and Thiansheng Mountains, west of the Mongolian desert. Compared with its American congener, it is inferior in stature, has shorter legs, a longer body, and proportionately larger antlers, though none have yet approached those of the longest American specimens. These splendid stags, of which living specimens have been maintained by the Duke of Bedford at Woburn, are captured alive by the Altai natives, and kept in domestication for the sake of their antlers, which are sold in China for purposes of medicine at as much as the value of ten pounds apiece. The Manchurian wapiti, or Ludorf's stag, is a well-marked local race of the wapiti, which turns reddish in summer. It has received several names, and is well characterized by the form of its antlers. 
It has been kept alive in the Duke of Bedford's park at Woburn Abbey. It seems probable that the Siberian stags will eventually be referred to the Wapiti group. Bokhara Deer A fine deer from Russian Turkestan is at present known as the Bokhara Deer. It is said to resemble the shoe of northern Bhutan more than any other species, and standing about four feet at the shoulder, is of an ashen gray color, tinged with yellow. A living specimen has been exhibited at Moscow, and it is believed that specimens in the collection of the Duke of Bedford belong to this form. Sikas The Sikas, as typified by the Japanese deer, are a group of deer of moderate size, distinguished from the preceding assemblage by antlers of simpler type each antler having usually four points, and lacking the second or bez tine. The coat is spotted with white, and white markings appear about the tail. The tail is much longer than in the red deer group. The Japanese deer, found in Japan and North China, is a beautiful creature, somewhat smaller than the fallow deer of Europe, having a coat of brilliant chestnut, thickly spotted with white in curious longitudinal markings. This is the summer pelage. In winter, the color changes to dark brown, and the spots mostly disappear. When in the velvet, the antlers are of a bright chestnut red, with black tips, and at this season the bucks look their handsomest. A good head measures from 26 to 31 inches, and carries usually 8 points. The Manchurian Sika may be looked upon as a larger variety of the Japanese deer, with a somewhat darker coat. Another closely allied form is the Formosan Sika, which bears a rather paler summer coat and carries spots in its winter pelage. This deer is found on the mountains of the island from which it takes its name. The few antlers which have reached this country seem to indicate that in this respect this deer is inferior to the other Sikas. The longest pair yet recorded measure not more than 19 and 3 quarter inches. The Pekin Sika, sometimes known as Dybowski's deer, is considerably larger in size than the rest of the group, standing well over three feet at the shoulder. The horns are large and rugged and measure as much as 27 inches in length. The coat is thick and shaggy, and well adapted for life in a harsh climate. The habitat of this species is northeastern Manchuria and the borders of Korea. Fallow Deer Fallow deer are, perhaps, to English people, the most familiar of all the Servine race, forming, as they do, in the semi-domesticated state, the adornments of most of our parks. The flesh of this handsome deer furnishes the well-known venison of this country, and is perhaps the best tasted of all deer meat. A good fallow buck stands about three feet at the shoulder, and weighs clean about 150 pounds, though specimens have been shot weighing as much as 204 pounds, but this is exceptional. The horns are strongly palmated. Originally, this deer was not indigenous to Britain, but is often said to have been introduced by the Romans from Eastern Europe. The common fallow deer is found in the wild state in Spain, Portugal, Greece, Austria, Rhodes, Sardinia, Asia Minor, and North Palestine. It is doubtful whether, as has been stated, this deer ever existed in modern times in the wild state in North Africa. This is a highly gregarious species, delighting to move in considerable herds. In some parts of Scotland, fallow deer have reverted completely to the wild state and afford excellent sport. And even park deer, once they are shot at, exhibit extraordinary wariness and cunning so much so that curious tricks and disguises have often to be resorted to when a fat buck has to be shot for venison. The beautiful Mesopotamian fallow deer, found in the mountains of Luristan, in Mesopotamian Persia, is somewhat larger than the common species, while its coat is much more brightly colored. The antlers bear little resemblance to those seen in the park deer of this country, being far less palmated and spreading and more vertical. The enormous horns of the extinct deer, once known as Irish elk, are now considered by naturalists to be those of a gigantic species of fallow deer. By the kindness of Mr. J. G. Millais, I am enabled to give the dimensions of a pair of antlers of one of these wonderful beasts from his museum. These antlers measure in spread from tip to tip 9 feet 4 inches, length round inside of right horn 6 feet, 
round left horn, 5 feet 8 inches. A marvelous trophy, truly. This specimen was dug up in County Waterford. These colossal fallow deer, which roamed the wastes of Ireland in prehistoric times, must have afforded fairly exciting sport to the feebly armed human beings who then existed. End of section 51. Recorded by Autumn, Rhinelander, Wisconsin.